Many that know her call her an empathetic but an effective leader. And that's Senate President Kathleen Pasadoma, who just finished her second and final session at the helm. Uh, first of all, how does it feel? It feels great. I, it was an amazing session, amazing two sessions. I feel like we accomplished so much and I feel good. I feel great. Two years, you've been at the helm and you're at the helm until, until November uh, before you pass over to the next guy, Ben Albrin, who we'll talk about a little bit in the few, in, in later on. Uh, your first year, you focused a lot on your big initiative, which, which was Live Local. Yes. Tell us about that. It, you know, obviously, uh, Florida, like every other state, has a huge problem with uh, workforce housing. And uh, we've been talking about it for in Collier County for 40 years and never did anything about it. And the state has only gotten worse and worse. And so uh, the first thing I did when I became president was sit down with policy advisors, stakeholders, uh, developers, uh, local government to, to ask the question, what's missing and it was determined it was the missing middle and that is housing for people who are making too much money to qualify for federal aid or some of florida programs uh, but not enough money to afford to live in a community so uh, we spent all summer uh, the summer of uh, 2022 crafting uh, a robust piece of legislation that will address workforce housing crisis in florida what are some of the incentives for builders to uh, give this workforce housing? And then tell us how uh, properties that have built, been built within the last five years can mm -hmm. also qualify, right? Yeah, I, one of the important things that we recognize is that uh, they, the, insur the insurance is high. We couldn't do anything about it, but the property uh, taxes have been high in, in a lot of these uh, rental uh, uh, projects. So we, we basically are giving uh, the owners of these uh, rental projects, if they can dedicate 30%, 40%, 50 to affordable housing, to workforce housing, they could charge market rate for the remainder, but for the, the uh, affordable units that they're charging lesser rent, we are giving them tax breaks and, 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 and allowing local governments to do that. The other thing that we're doing, and, and it's unfortunate we had to do this, in that many local governments for years have been talking about the lack of workforce housing, but the reality is they didn't want to do anything about it. They didn't want to have people who worked in their communities live in their communities. So we had to pass some legislation, a speed tracking, uh, workforce housing programs and the like. And now a lot of our local governments are coming on board because they're seeing that the people that are availing themselves of the units that are being built and that have been built within the last five years that can also get the tax breaks are the people who work with them every day. For example, um, this program will help someone who graduates from law school, who gets a job with the state attorney's office, starts out making $75,000 a year. You cannot live in most places in Florida for that. And they would qualify. So we're not talking about the stereotypical ghetto kind of uh, projects. We're talking about uh, housing for people who work with us every day. Law, uh, the uh, um, uh, policemen, the firefighters, nurses, teachers, and, and it's going to work. So that was your big initiative in the first year. Second year, this past session, which was your Live Healthy program. Yes. Uh, it, it, uh, it, the other thing that has been a problem in Florida, uh, the free state of Florida, and I told the governor it's his fault because of his policies and the kind of uh, initiatives that he'd undertaken, um, so many people are moving to Florida, 300,000 people a year and they don't bring their doctors with them. So right now we don't have enough healthcare personnel to manage the uh, healthcare of our citizens today. Whether you have insurance or no insurance, whether you're a millionaire or you're uh, a, a, an indigent, if there aren't enough doctors to treat you, you're not gonna be seen. So we undertook last summer to build a whole program of trying to attract uh, new uh, medical personnel to Florida from other states. Um, we also are adding additional um, residency slots in our uh, hospitals. 
Um, we are we're doing some, we're trying to make healthcare efficient, effective, and economical. And we're doing a lot of very common sense things to do that. Um, that that uh, package is really more than one bill because not just the uh, workforce development, but we also have a whole component on behavioral health, uh, a bill that's totally different. And this whole live healthy thing has never been done anywhere in the country. Uh, the behavioral health program is uh, to create a system of uh, behavioral health teaching hospitals, which we don't have in Florida today, so that we grow a workforce of behavioral health specialists, psychiatrists down to social workers, a psychologist, uh, people who would be in, in that, that industry, uh, partnering uh, hospitals with universities to grow the workforce to research why people have uh, behavioral health issues and also to treat people, particularly people who can't go home because there's some people just can't go home. And our hope is that we can identify uh, individuals that have serious illnesses uh, and treat them rather than uh, what typically happens, they commit a crime, half times they don't even know what it is and they end up in jail. So that's, then there's also a whole innovation uh, portion of the, of the package, which is technology. Uh, technology is gonna be a game changer. Uh, we all know about telehealth. Uh, telemental health is working. And so we, we are looking for uh, technology to change the whole uh, system of healthcare in our state. One of my favorite initiatives of yours, because I'm going to be personally contributing to this fund, is you are real allocating the, yes. the, the funds from the gaming compact, right. which I want you to explain what the gaming compact is mm -hmm. for all our viewers that don't know what that is. And that's going towards the wildlife corridor, clean water projects, Everglades restoration right. and, and whatnot. So first of all, tell us what's the gaming compact? So uh, several years ago, the state of Florida entered into an agreement, a compact with the Seminole Tribe of Florida, which operates uh, casinos in Florida. As you know, uh, the, uh, the tribe is the only uh, entity authorized to uh, have the kind of gaming that we, we'd have in Florida today. Uh, as part of the compact to give them that uh, privilege, they agreed to pay us a minimum of $450 million a year. They anticipated it could be up to $700, $750 million a year. Um, and one of the things that I recall meeting with the chairman of the, of the tribe, uh, um, Osceola, and he talked about uh, the tribe's stewardship of the land, the historical uh, importance that the land has to the tribe. And if you go on the Seminole Tribes website, there's a whole page dedicated to the preservation of the land. And I thought, what better way to spend the money that comes from the gaming compact than preservation of the land? So we, uh, we call it Compact to Conserve. And those funds, uh, and the speaker and I worked together on that. It was a wonderful uh, collaboration. Uh, one third of it uh, will go to acquisition of lands or conservation easements uh, to buy out the development rights of the farmers and ranchers, let them continue to farm and ranch, uh, but they cash out so that they don't sell to a developer. Uh, the uh, One third of it will go to the actual management of the lands that we acquire because you know you could buy all this land, but if you don't manage it, then we're going to end up having it turn into wild uh, areas, and, and and we'll have exotics and etc. You know, we always talk about the pythons and the malaleucas and whatever, and then a, a third of it to uh, water, water, water. So it's um, uh, you know water quality, water quantity, um, resiliency, and my goal is to embed that program into the heart of the of the state and of the legislature so that we never uh, sweep it, we never use it to uh, fund deficits in other areas, that we always use it for conservation, for the environment, um, and it'll be for the future generation. Part of it, of course, in the acquisition is the wildlife corridor, which um, is really one of the crowning uh, shining jewels of our state. So every single gamble I make, every single time I <laughs> gamble, <little> <laughs> I gamble on an NFL game. 
it goes into preserving just a tiny bit but it'll all add up <laughs> and conserving the lands of florida which I, without it i mean florida right. just it our economy our tourism right. it all centers around um the outdoors really it florida. would not be sustainable uh, because Florida is such an attractive place that more and more people want to come here. And, and so they're going to start a, a building up, building out rather the central part of our state, which is right now pretty much rural. Right. And we want the rural areas of our state to be um, economically productive, but we don't want to just have one housing tract after the other. So there are other things we can do, like with the wildlife corridor, we're going to build a bike path through it so that people can enjoy the center part of our state in a really uh, sort of a tourist friendly way. So there's a lot of things that we've done over the last two years that I'm, I'm really proud of. And I, and I have to give a shout out for the speaker because uh, he and I uh, worked uh, hand in hand uh, with every single initiative. And I, and, I, and I think we, I don't know, we keep hearing it was the sessions of the century, so I'll take that. And Wildlife Corridor, yeah. tell us more about what you got done there? Well, we've, we've been acquiring more and more land, uh, whether it be outright purchases or conservation easements. And a lot of people don't uh, appreciate the wildlife corridors basically will be the entire center part of the state. And it, it will be um, a, a place where it's a refuge for, for our, our wild animals. How do we say, the only way we'll be able to save the Florida panther is to give them habitat. Right. And that would go through the corridor. At the same time, we're buying out the development rights of the ranchers and the farmers, but they'll continue to ranch and farm. And something that people don't think about is that we're talking about, for years, we've been talking about dependence on foreign oil. What about dependence on foreign food? Mm -hmm. Our rural communities have been the, the winter capital vegetable of the entire eastern seaboard. As those farms uh, are sold and turned into condominiums and housing developments, we are losing more and more of those vegetables. That's not a good thing. So uh, it's a win-win for the state. We have uh, the corridor, which will be undeveloped. Farmers continue to farm. And I say, every time I talk about it, that it will be our central park. One of uh, an initiative that you are started on your way out the door, but you're, you're hanging around for two more years yeah. after uh, being Senate president because of this initiative, which is Learn Local. Because Oh, yeah, yeah. So you, you are pushing to deregulate public schools to kind of get them on an even playing field exactly. with, with yeah. charter schools, private schools, right. so that parents have even more options because we've become the school choice state of America, really. That's right. That's and, right. Um, I want you to, first of all, tell us why it's... I kind of I kind of stole your glory there. No, I, why, why, why do we need to deregulate schools first of all? Well, first of all, thank you for for uh, you know synthesizing it because a lot of people don't understand, and, and it's it's clear you do. Um, you know, as we have been going down a path uh, of school choice, parents deciding where to send their children, uh, the public schools have been saying all along we get giving charter schools more uh, ability to operate. We get. Uh, funding, uh, uh, you know, the funds follow the student. But you don't require of them what you require of us. And they're right, right. because I know I've been in the legislature since 2010 in every single session. We have four or five or six bills where we say the public schools shall do X. The public schools shall do, you know, the school districts, they say, well, shall do Y. We never ex expanded to charters or the private schools. So we have a regulation book like this. And I went through it last summer with staff and, and some of it was stupid. I voted for it. So, um, and the, the school superintendents were saying, look, we get what you're doing, but at least give us grace as well. Level the playing field. We want to compete on a level playing field. And I'm like, Bingo. As long as you don't uh, in some way affect the quality of the education, which we don't. So we did three bills, uh, Senator Simon, uh, Senator Hudson, and Senator Kaladiud, uh sponsored them, and they were really thoughtful. Uh, we started out with dere deregulating about 180 uh, requirements, and I, uh, w you know, we whittled it down, uh, working with our partners in the House. And... Uh, I think uh, my successor uh, uh, as president, Ben Albritton, is committed to continuing that process. It's a multi, 
Yes. It's going to, it's a multi-session effort to Absolutely. get the schools, the, the public school districts to an even playing field. Right. And Senator Alexis Collado Yud, and I said her name right. She's going to watch yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, she's going to watch this and say, there you go, Brendan. Good job. You, you said it right. Uh, and Senator Corey Simon, uh, both of them uh, played crucial roles in getting Absolutely. this initiative passed for you. And they were two quality candidates that Absolutely. you at the head of yeah. Senate campaigns recruited and mm -hmm and help run and win their elections. Yeah, we had uh, the, th that election cycle was just unbelievable. We had the Both best- Both seats they flipped too. They did. They are, they are amazing candidates, amazing senators. We have the best group of senators that I've seen uh, in my whole years of service and uh, thoughtful, dedicated. They all have servants' hearts and they're working really hard to advance our conservative agenda without a whole lot of fanfare, with a whole lot of, without a whole lot of hooting and hollering and carrying on. They just do their job every day and they care about their constituents. And that's, that's what our job is. And you guys have a super majority we now. Do. We and do. And Alexis Claudeud and uh, Corey Simon played a big integral part in that's that. That's right. I mean, just talk about the quality of, it's just, it's amazing when you sit back and watch and see them flip these blue seats. Absolutely. Right. Well, Corey Simon is the first time in like 16 years, I think. Yeah, and, and when you see, you, you know, he is a dyed-in-the-wool Republican, very thoughtful, uh, fiscally conservative, uh, socially conservative. He has a strong a moral compass, strong moral values. But he understands his community. And one of the problems that we have in our day and age is that there are 40 senators, and each of us represents about 360,000 people, and they all don't think alike. And it's not right for us to say to them, uh, it's my way or the highway. We have to listen to them and hear what they have to say, and we, and we do. And, we, you know, we have been very successful in the initiatives we've undertaken. They've all been very conservative. They've all, they've all been thoughtful, um, and I, I feel really proud. I feel really proud. Something that's not talked about enough is uh, how it's a big team effort. Mm -hmm. The Senate, Senate Republicans, um, the Senate president's in charge of Senate campaigns, which it's their job to elect Republicans across the state. And you guys have played an integral part in that. that. Talk about uh, the success you've had from your predecessor, from Wilton to you, and then to the future success that, that Ben will be able to have because you guys have, have continued a great line of, of wins. First of all, it starts with having uh, a great group of candidates. Uh, President, uh, former President Simpson had a really good um, group of people, picking good consultants, and more than anything, raising a lot of money. And he did. He was amazing. And then he started. Uh, and, and then I took it over from there. Uh, I'm proud to say I raised $40 million in a year and a half. And um, the candidates that I had, as you mentioned, Senator Calante Yud, Senator Simon, and others uh, are just stellar. Uh, and then it's having, making sure we can get across our agenda to the public. And we did. And because of that, we ended up with a supermajority. And the other thing we don't do is we don't uh, crow on it. We don't, um, we're just quiet about it. We don't run roll over the Democrats. Why would we do that when we can pass our agenda and we have a good agenda and we and we pass some good, meaningful policies? And um, you know, some of them were uh, controversial, but they were the right thing to do, and we did them. And I think we'll continue to do that under uh, uh, Senate President to be <laughs> Albright. Why do you think he's the right man for the job? He he's really a very. Uh, he does have a servant's heart. He's very thoughtful. He's very caring. He's very loyal. Um, uh, he has really uh, great ideas. He, because he's a, he comes from a farming background, he's very interested in the land as well. And a lot of what he, and in the environment, a lot of what he's interested in is in that realm. Um, he's also very interested in, in kids and families. Um, because, you know, he's just become a grandfather, uh, you know, over the last couple of years. And so he's really into that. I think he's going to do a really super job. And, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm staying, because I want to help him uh, get his agenda across the finish line. And I, it's so great to see that you guys, 
it's like you see eye to eye with the deregulating we do. the schools. So we it do. goes back to that point of te there's a lot of teamwork when it comes to the Senate and the Senate's becoming the Senate campaign is becoming a well-oiled machine. It is. We we really um, uh, we do have a, a great machine going. We have really good people, uh, good staff uh, that we are able to keep uh, full time. And uh, they're, they're, they're thoughtful and they help guide us. You know, they, particularly when you're dealing with, uh, you know, what, are the, what is the public thinking? And, you know, a lot of times we get stuck in an ivory tower, I almost say, in Tallahassee. Tallahassee is a bubble. Um, but, you know, we have to make sure that we hear our constituents and get back home. And we keep saying it to, to the, our candidates, to our members, to the senators, when you go home, Spend the time with your constituents to hear what's important to them. Because what's important to your constituents is not necessarily what they're talking about in Washington or at the uh, REC meetings. It's all about, you know, family values, kitchen table issues, um, you know, workforce housing. I hear that all the time. Where am I going to live? Where are my kids going to live? Um, property insurance is a big deal, which is why we uh, passed that uh, tort reform bill. Those are the kind of things that people care about, uh, and and we have we are challenged and to to uh, address them, and then we do some of the other uh, uh, things too, the social things. But the reality is, it's the kitchen table issues. It's putting uh, food on the table, place to live, um, and you know where you want to retire. And I, I feel like those kitchen table. I feel like the Florida Republicans as a whole kind of renewed their focus under. Uh, started laying the groundwork a lot under Governor Rick Scott. Yeah, yeah. Where they were like, we need, you know what, we need to focus on these kitchen table issues. And to your point, when you said, we're not rubbing it in the Democrats' face, we're just putting forward our agenda, which exactly. is focusing on the people around the, the issues right. around the kitchen table. I mean, Tallahassee, the conservatives, they've been working for years. We and, have. And Governor DeSantis is continuing that ball rolling and then, and then with you guys. He's amazing. You know, I, I've gotten to know him pretty well and I get along really well with him. He's, he's really a very thoughtful guy. You know, uh, when Hurricane Ian devastated Southwest Florida, he was there right away and almost every day. And I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, the empathy that he had for um, the people who lost their homes, they lost their family members, lost their lives. You know, he was not just doing it uh, because he was governor. He was doing it as a person. Um, the environment, the first thing he did after he was elected uh, was uh, come, uh, come down here and start talking about uh, water, water, water and, and environmental issues. These are things people care about. You know, some of the other issues that we keep getting uh, chastised for are important. You know, the books in the schools and, and you know, uh, family values. That's part of our our uh, agenda, that's the right thing to do. What I, my whole guiding principles are always, what is the right thing to do? And if you follow that, you can never go wrong. And it's just, sometimes it's hard because you get pushed and pulled by different people all the time with um, their version. And, and of course, a lot of what we do has been manipulated by others to uh, appear to be different than what it was. And it's stress, it's stressful and, and distressing because we do a lot of good and we, you know, we just get chastised for it. My last question for you, happy note. What's your favorite memory as Senate president? Oh my God. It's, um, the, the, the thing that, that I remember the most is, you know, coming into the chamber and going up on the rostrum and looking out over the members of the Senate and having a conversation and the conversation is legislation that we passed. And it's a really a conversation. And doing it collaboratively and, um, and meaningfully. So it's a collective memory. Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo will go down in the history books here in Florida for sure. We appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank you.